Hello, seniors. It's been a while, and I'm glad to see you all again. Another journey is yet to overcome. Let's step ahead in learning another exciting area of science that concerned with the study of inanimate natural objects, including physics, chemistry, astronomy, and related subjects. Students, it's time to learn physical science. lesson today is Special Theory of Relativity. At the end of this module, you should be able to explain the conflict between the theory of electromagnetism and Newtonian mechanics and explain how special relativity resolved the conflict between Newtonian mechanics and Maxwell's theory of electromagnetic theory. In order to understand physics, one must start with a thoughtful learning experience of motion, time, and space. Since these three are in every activity of our daily living, one can fully understand our interaction with everything here in Earth and even everything outside it. The special theory of relativity was coined and developed by Albert Einstein in 1905 as an answer to the long debated conflict between James Clerk Maxwell's theory of electromagnetism and Isaac Newton's three laws of motion. Before Einstein's theory of relativity, the idea of relativity prominently started with Galileo who explained that all events of motion are observed or measured with respect to an observer's point of reference. Wherever you happen to be right now, it seems like you are at a fixed point, and that things move relative to you. All you, have, all you do is to select a fixed coordinate for space and time, commonly called a frame of reference. You then simply add or subtract any relative velocity because the laws of motion do not change in a uniform or an inertial frame of reference. Recall that the concept of inertia was first hinted at by Galileo. The term was first used by Kepler and finally the definition was first given and used by Newton. Long before the development of the special theory of relativity, there were two great theories of physics. The theory of electromagnetics developed by James Clerk Maxwell and the three laws of motion by Isaac Newton. In 1687, Newtonian mechanics, also called classical mechanics, combined into one the theory of Kepler's planetary laws of motion, Galileo's law of relativity for uniform motion, Descartes' law of conservation of momentum, and Huygens analysis of circular motion. The mechanics explains that space or distance, time and mass are absolute. This means that the distance between two objects and the time that passes between two events does not depend on the environment where the object is in. In this theory, the motion of both heavenly and terrestrial objects is built on one force law and three independent basic concepts of the absolute time. That is the same for all observers on Earth as well as for those in orbit that imply simultaneous events independent of location and state of motion. And absolute three-dimensional space where any object can freely move and the inertial mass of objects that resist acceleration from Newtonian mechanics. All inertial frames, physical laws, and universal concerns that arise in it are the same. Furthermore, according to Newton's second law, objects in the environment moves in a straight line. Hence, the change of location from one environment to another environment must register a straight line to other straight lines. Moreover, it is said that no matter where you are or how fast you are moving, there will be no changes in space or time. In all places, a kilometer is a kilometer and a minute is a minute, and you can travel as fast as you want with adequate acceleration. On the other hand, Maxwell's electromagnetic theory in 1856 integrated into four mathematical equations the extensive research of Faraday and others 
that led to the fact that electrical and magnetic fields propagate as electromagnetic waves at the same constant speed with which light travels in the vacuum. James Clerk Maxwell had predicted that the electric field, magnetic field, and light are different representations of the same phenomena or event. He further predicted that visible lights are electromagnetic waves that move in a manner like ripples in the water where, uh, when a stone is dropped. According to Maxwell, light as a wave have both electrical and magnetic components and that it moves at a constant speed of 186,000 miles per second. It means that the speed of light is the same for everything and for all observers. There is only one conflict between the two theories. According to Maxwell, light in a vacuum moves at 186,000 miles per second and it does not change for all observers and situation. However, according to Newtonian physics, all speeds are relative, meaning speed depend on the observer's viewpoint and situation. 30 years later, when Einstein was 7 years old, Hertz first demonstrated the production and transmission of one of the electromagnetic waves when he experimentally produced radio pulses. Another nine years later, Einstein at 16 amused himself with the thought experiment of him chasing a beam of light while riding another beam. But the manner of adding light velocities according to Newtonian mechanics obviously contradicting the constancy of the speed of light according to the electromagnetic theory has occupied Einstein's mind during his spare time well into his mid-20s. In 1905, Albert Einstein published his observation about the differing ideas of the two theories through the special theory of relativity. His theory is based on the observations of events from different viewpoints. He stressed that while Newtonian physics is true, Maxwell's theory is also correct. The theory of special relativity proposed by Einstein in 1905 is a theory in physics that concerns the relationship between space and time for objects that move uniformly near the speed of light in a straight line. Simply put, an object approaching the speed of light would make its mass infinite while reaching its cosmic limit and it is unable to go any faster than the speed of light. This generally accepted. He resolved the opposing ideas by establishing the two foundations of the special theory of relativity. Let us look closer at the two main postulates of special relativity. First, the laws of physics are the same in all inertial frames of reference. In an inertial reference frame, any object experiences no net force and so is considered either at rest or moving uniformly with constant speed in the same direction. In this frame of reference and without communication with the outside world, one cannot tell whether one is at rest or one is moving with constant velocity. Therefore, all laws of nature are the same in this inertial frames of reference. If you measure the length of a 30 cm box with you on any ground or inside a bus moving with constant velocity, you will get the same 30 cm measurement. Or if you swing a pendulum on the ground or inside the uniformly moving bus and measure its period, you will also have the same measurements when on either inertial frame of reference for the same laws of physics are valid on each location. If you do the same set of measurements with you at rest on the ground while the box and the swinging pendulum you are measuring are inside the uniformly moving bus, then this time you will have measured different lengths for the box and periods for the pendulum. Being aware now that you as an observer is relatively outside the inertial reference frame of the object you are measuring, try as you might with being careful with your measurements. You will always have a preference for one or the other. 
Another example, a teenage boy is standing inside a train that is passing equally between two oak trees. Because the train is moving, he saw that a lightning struck the tree on his left first, then the tree on the light, right. Another boy, who is standing at the train platform, also saw the same event. Only in his viewpoint, the lightning struck both trees at the same time. Although the same laws of physics apply, now you must take into account the relative transformations in time, space, matter, and energy, which become more pronounced when the relative motion between the observer and the observed event or motion moves close to the speed of light. This brings us to the second equivalent postulate. The second postulate means that for all reference frames, the speed of light or C is the same no matter what the relative speed is between observer and that which is being observed. Be it moving matter, flowing energy, or an event that occurs within invariant intervals of space and time. In other words, the speed of light is a universal constant in the natural world. Suppose you are in a car going at 30 km per hour or kph and your cup flies off your head at 10 kph in the other direction the car is going. If you were standing on the roadside with a reader gun, you would measure the cup going 30 kph minus 10 kph equals 20 kph. That is how we classically or very low speeds compared to light deal with relative motion. Now, suppose you are in the car at night. If you could measure the speed of light coming out of your headlights, you would get the same speed from the radar gun no matter how fast the car was going forward or backward. Light would still be moving at its constant speed. That is what makes light special. Another example, an astronaut that is moving towards the source of light will think that light is moving at 186,000 miles per second. Hence, an astronaut that is not moving towards the source of light will think that light is moving at 186,000 miles per second. And in short, regardless of the rate movement of the source of light and the rate movement of the astronauts, the speed of light will remain the same. This postulates imply that events that are happening at the same time for one observer may not be simultaneous for another. Second, when two observers moving relative to each other measure a time or space, they may not have the same results. Third, for the momentum and energy to be conserved in, a, in all inertial systems, Newton's second law and the equations of momentum and kinetic energy must be revised. Simply put, these two postulates clarify that if two events happen at different places, it is not always likely to say which of the two events happens first or that they occur at the same time. That's the end of our lesson today. It's been my pleasure teaching you one of the amazing topics of physical science and I really hope you learned something from this video lesson. Thank you and may God bless us all. Let's meet again in our next video.